Tom Civic, uh, president and CEO of Five Prime, um, who recently joined the company back in April from Foundation Medicine, where he was chief commercial officer. Uh, we also have Dr. Helen Collins, who is Five Prime's chief medical officer here, here today at the Webbush Healthcare Conference. Uh, I'm Robert Driscoll. I'm one of the senior biotech panelists here. Um, so, so let's go ahead and get started. So th thanks for joining us today. Um, Robert, thanks, Five Prime was, for, thanks for having uh, Helen and I are we're really, we're really pleased to be here. Uh, great. Uh, Five Prime was really built around this um, proprietary platform that identified a large number of novel targets on oncology. So maybe you can just um, to begin, we can give we can have a brief introduction to Five Prime for folks who are less familiar uh, with you know where me where the company stands today with respect to its overall pipeline. Uh, and, and I know you've been asked this question a number of times, Tom, over the last few months, but maybe what attracted you to join the company? Sure. Well, Robert, before we get started, I, I think it's it's probably important to start with. Um, Helen and I are, are really excited to share what promises to be a really exciting next few quarters for Five Prime. We've got two really important data readouts that are right on the horizon, either later this year or early next year, and um, we're excited to dive into those both those programs um, in just a minute. Um, let me start with your second question first. Uh, what what attracted me to to Five Prime? So I. I joined the organization four months ago, as you mentioned, um, and and what attracted me was was the science and the people. Um, it was clear from when I started um, evaluating Five Prime from a distance that it's an organization that has a deep foundation of science focused on trying to develop therapies for cancers that are hard to treat, and that attracts me. I've I've had the the privilege of working on some some revolutionary therapies and diagnostics over the last 20 years in the industry. And Five Prime is is right on the cusp of being able to evaluate some really interesting and potentially game changing um, cancer therapy. So that that excited me. Um, great science is is one step, but um, having a, a great team around you is the other one. And from the the moment I met folks like Helen um, on the team, I, I knew that it was a place that um, we could we could collaborate and work together on trying to make a dent in cancer. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be part of the Five Prime team. There's um, a lot of exciting work going on, and um, uh, Helen and I are really um, proud to be representing our team here today. Um, let me take a step back. You had you had asked about sort of the the journey for Five Prime. Um, we have we've been a, a science first organization um, for quite some time, and that science is now at a place where we're about to turn over some really important. Um, um, trials to, to see if the science matches the clinical impact. And so right now we're a, we're a focused clinical stage company with two near-term clinical programs and, and a portfolio of really interesting preclinical assets um, that we're, we're making great advances on. Brilliant. Um, let's go ahead and start with you. The lead clinical ans asset, uh, bimarituzumab. Um, Maybe you could remind folks of the rationale for targeting FGFR2B and you know what, what really excites you about this program. Yeah, Robert, I'll get started and then and, and Helen can dive into what we're doing with the program. So um, let's start with the disease. So gastric cancer is the fifth leading cause of cancer death globally. And the last targeted approved therapy um, was over a decade ago. So th there's a really significant need here for, for better patient care. What we've, what we've decided to do is, is study our, our lead product, Bemertuzumab, we'll call it BEMA from this point forward um, to make it a little bit easier in a trial that we're calling the FIGHT trial. And this trial is a global trial where we're enrolling patients um, look at in the frontline setting for gastric cancer. There's two things that we learned um, about this program since we started it. One was, um, the significant need. And, and I can give you one example um, that really brings this to life, which is how quickly the trial enrolled. Um, the investigators were extraordinarily excited about the program and, and we enrolled it in, in rapid time, screened over 900 patients. Um, second, we had a, a really important learning um, was that when we were screening these patients, we were able to confirm that about 30% of gastric cancer patients have tumors that overexpress FGFR2B. And, and this is a really important um, learning that we had as, as the product that we're developing targets FGFR2B. So let me let me kick it over to Helen to, to go a little bit deeper on our BEMA program. Yeah, um, 
Hey, Robert. Uh, so I think um, you know, the FGF pathway is, is a pretty important one in cancers. And you know, we've seen a couple of drugs approved in other diseases that are targeting this pathway. And in gastric cancer, we found about 30% of patients in the frontline setting overexpress FGFR2B, which is a specific form of this FGF or fibroblast growth factor uh, receptor. And our antibody works two ways. One is it blocks that receptor, so it stops these, F these growth factors from stimulating the cancer to divide. And, uh, and then the other thing it does is it's if you collate it, which means it's engineered so that the uh, IG1 sticky end, if you will, pulls in natural killer T cells. So there's two ways that this uh, kills gastric cancer cells. And we've shown that it's efficacious in the late line setting where we had an 18% response rate, which is uh, really quite amazing in sort of the third, third, fourth line setting of gastric cancer. When you think of a couple of most recent drugs approved were had response rates in the three and 4%. So it was really this uh, tolerability, um, the mechanism of action, observing uh, uh, single agent efficacy, which was our investigators that said, you know, you really should go to the frontline setting because uh, that's where the greatest need is. These patients have an even worse prognosis than what Tom just described for the average gastric cancer patient. And, uh, um, and so, you know, as Tom said, this program has been going on for a while. We started enrolling our first patient in September of 2018. So it's really exciting to, to be getting this data out soon and, and find out um, and get some results. So. Great. Um, so so BMU, you know, currently, as you said, in the fight study. So this started out as a phase three, uh, but the strategic decision to convert it to a phase two was made back in early May. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could uh, just describe, you know, where the study stands currently, you know, maybe talk a little bit about why that decision was taken and maybe looking forward what you'll be looking for from the data yourself. Sure, Robert, I'll, I'll start with um, the decision. So uh, when I joined the organization, um, we were knee deep in, in evaluating the options for the flight trial. And it became really clear that converting to a phase two trial gave um, us some really important benefits. And the, the biggest one being having data sooner so we could better inform the next steps of the program. And, and this is, you know, I think as we do every, with everything at Five Prime, this is a, a patient-centered decision that allows us to evaluate um, this potential therapy um, as quickly as possible. So converting it to a phase two allows us to interrogate the data much more quickly, and, and we're expecting to have that data in hand um, later this year or early next year. We, we also believe that the BEMA is, is a program that could benefit from a global partner. Um, and so with most of gastric cancer happening outside the United States, we, we know that it's important for our partners to, to potentially interrogate the data as well. So they'll have a chance to do that sooner. And then lastly, um, in the event that the phase two is negative, um, it, it does give us an opportunity to, to reallocate our resources and our time um, towards our other products in the portfolio. So if anything, the, the, the most important takeaway from that is the decision allows us to have access to the data much more quickly than had we if we kept going with the current plan. So fully um, uh, excited that we're going to be able to turn over those cards later this year and, and better determine our next steps. Maybe Helen can give you an update on, on where we are and um, what we expect the next steps to be. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So we've enrolled, uh, I think as Tom was saying, 155 patients. Um, and, uh, and really what we're doing is waiting for events. The one change aside from the number of patients, the trial design itself didn't change in terms of it being double blind, placebo controlled. Everybody's getting modified full FOX6. Um, it's a global trial, right? So we've enrolled in China with Zai as our partner there, other places in Asia, the US and Europe. And, um, and you know, what we had also did was we changed the primary endpoint from OS2 or overall survival to progression-free survival. That's fairly typical for a phase two trial uh, because of course you again, get your results sooner and we will have more events. And so that's gonna be important in 155 patient uh, trial, but we're also still collecting overall survival and response rate. So, um, and as uh, Tom said, I think, the biggest thing is really just to have all of the data to really look and see, are all the patients benefiting equally? Are there subgroups that are benefiting? This will really allow us to look at all of those details and then plan the best steps for, for the patients and, and for Five Prime. Hey, Robert, let me, let me just add that um, uh, 
uh, one of the things that that's that's worth noting here is that with with the pandemic, um, we we have not seen any impact to to the fight trial or the BEMA program. Um, Helen's team has done an extraordinary job of of um, working with the investigators to ensure that uh, the the events stay on track and that we're able to evaluate this program <laughs> later this year or early next year. So yeah, um, at this point we we we've been we think really fortunate, um, but we're doing everything in our power to ensure that. Um, the, the data is available later this year or early next year. Brilliant. Um, you, you mentioned your partner in the program. Uh, you are a partner with Xilabs uh, on this program in China, or Greater China, uh, obviously one of the, the highest incidents of, of gastric cancer in the world. Could you talk a little bit about the importance of this collaboration uh, and, and maybe the, the opportunity outside the, the Greater China region? Yeah, maybe Helen, um, probably best for you to start with our, our partnership with Zai and, and I can I can take the second part of Robert's question. I mean, Zai has been a, a great partner. I mean, in terms of how the, in terms of their, um, let me, I'm backing up. When we started the study, essentially, we, Five Prime is the global sponsor. Uh, Zai is in charge of enrollment and all of the activities that happen in mainland or greater China. And I think we, you know, we'd said this previously, they actually enrolled the very first patient in this trial. So, um, so I think, you know, the investigators there have been equally excited and they've just been great, great partners to, to work with. So. Yeah, and Robert, I'll just add that, you know, when we, when we think about next steps and eventually getting to a place where we're hoping to commercialize this product, um, we, we know that uh, to, to really have the, the impact that we hope for so many cancer patients globally, Going to be important that we have a partner outside the United States that, that can help us commercialize it. So, we are um, we are talking to many interested parties at this point, um, and once the data becomes available, we'll we'll sort of move into the the next steps of that. Got it. And then, then maybe one last one from me on Beamer. Um, just just as far as targeted agents in in gastric cancer go, you know, Herceptin is approved in combination with chemo and frontline. Um, it seems to be working its way through different combinations as well in different patient populations. Do you see any read through or similarities from targeting HER2 um, that, would, that would give you confidence that BEMA will provide this clinical benefit for patients with FGF2R2 disease? Yeah, um, Robert, I, I think it, it's safe to say that we, we leveraged um, the, the knowledge that we were able to glean from the Herceptin studies and their approvals on how to design the program, um, where gastric cancer um, is most prevalent, and, and that information helped in, inform our, our program. That said, there, there's very little overlap between the patient population. So um, what, what's true for HER2 is, is, is likely not true for FGFR2B. And um, Helen mentioned it, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll reiterate it. You know, one of the things that excites us at Five Prime is, is trying to find novel new therapies for, for patients who don't have many options. And in this case, frontline gastric cancer, uh, besides the Herceptin population, uh, they continue to have to suffer through just having chemotherapy available to them. And so we're, we're, we're quite excited about potentially having a therapy that, that could have an impact on almost 30% of frontline gastric cancer patients. And, um, and, and we feel really good about the work that we've done around FGFR2B, um, the, the quality of the trial, and the ability to take a look at the data later this year or early next year, I think will really inform next steps for the program. Got it. Um, do, do have one question on Beamer from the audience. Um, just, just mainly relates to how the statistics may have changed in the fight study from the conversion from the phase three to the phase two and, and thinking about the powering. Mm -hmm. Sure, Helen, you wanna take that one? Yeah, yeah, I mean, we, we certainly, um, we backed into the statistics, right? So we had made a pause in enrollment and had announced we were considering a futility analysis till, you know, as Tom um, commented, as we looked at things more and thought about it from, uh, from the best thing for patients and for five prime, we thought the best thing was really to look at all the data and not just get a, a thumbs up, thumbs down. So that left us with 155 patients at, at the time that decision was made. So we do have statistics in the protocol that give us uh, good power for a phase two trial. Um, we haven't given the exact, uh, the exact um, statistical analysis plan. What we, what we are saying is that when we do come out with the data, we will give a hazard ratio and the appropriate p-value you know, uh, um, and, and make the announcement then. So 
Yeah, maybe Robert, I'll just add to it, you know, with 155 patients and PFS is our primary endpoint, we think it's well powered um, as it sits today. The, the, all, the, all the studies that we've looked at in gastric cancer, um, the, the PFS for frontline patients ranges anywhere from five to seven months. And um, that's not specific to FTFR2B, who we believe have a worse prognosis. And so, uh, obviously, this is this is why you do these sorts of studies. We're we're going to be extraordinarily interested in in interrogating the data fully to to better understand different patient populations and to see where the impact truly is, so we can design um, an efficient um, phase three trial. Got it. Um, I'm, I'm getting a message from the tech that we are currently down, so maybe we can just pause for for a couple of minutes. Great. Uh, let's let's go ahead and move to FPT one five five. Could you talk a little bit about the design and background of this molecule uh, and maybe the rationale behind a CD eight FC therapeutic? Yeah, this is this is um, a, a potential therapy that came out of our lab. We're we're really excited about it. It's 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 got a dual mechanism of action, um, immuno oncology, um, and has the potential to to really have an impact across multiple different tumor types and multiple different lines. Um, we right now are, are in a safety dose escalation study. We just, we just cleared our 11th dose cohort with no um, um, DLTs. And we've now just expanded at the 560 milligram dose um, into hot and warm tumors where we believe we should start to see efficacy. And um, what, we've, what we've been communicating, Robert, is that we, we believe that by the end of the year, we should have data in, our, in hand um, for this target patient population at a dose where we think we should have clinical efficacy to help inform the next steps of the program. Maybe Helen, it'd probably be good for you to, to jump in a little bit um, further about why we're so excited about this, um, this, this program. Yeah, yeah, Robert, I know you know a little bit about it, but it, you know, it's really a, a cool idea, if you will. Uh, you know, as you hinted in your first question to us, you know, Five Prime originally started as a as a discovery platform, or that was the the premise of its of its discovery group. And one of the things we were trying to do at Five Prime was find the best targets to either you know block the bad you know immune cells or stimulate the good ones. And this CD80 is is a normal protein that the body makes to stimulate T cells, and so it was being used as our positive control in all of our experiments. And uh, until somebody said, hey, you know, maybe we should just make this into a, a drug. And at first there was, even then, a, a lot of pushback because you may be familiar with the history of a drug called Tegenero, which was an yeah. antibody that acted against CD28, which is the target of the CD80 molecule. And that drug had a lot of toxicity, a lot of cytokine release syndrome. And so people had shied away that it, it, it certainly proved that this is the best way to stimulate T cells but potentially a very toxic way to do so. So the scientists came up with a way of saying, well, hey, how about if we take this CD80, we again add an FC um, gamma, so a little bit, piece of an antibody to it. And in that way, maybe we can get the best of both worlds. We can stimulate this CD28, stimulate those T cells, and also CD80 blocks CTLA-4. So, and as you know, there are drugs that are approved to block CTLA-4. And, um, and the way this works is that it will only stimulate that CD28 if there's already an interaction between an antigen presenting cell and the T cell receptor. So it's only going to stimulate those T cells that are arguably sitting in that tumor milieu and shouldn't cause cytokine release syndrome. So as you know, we presented our first data last year at SITSI showing that indeed the hypothesis is correct. We are not causing cytokine release syndrome. We've since then announced that we've you know, hitting doses where we're starting to see pharmacodynamic changes that you'd expect. So we know it's stimulating T cells. And then now based on our preclinical data, we think we have the proper receptor occupancy for both CTLA-4, 
and CD28, so again, these two markers on T cells that tell us we're in the right dose. And as Tom said, now uh, now's the exciting part because now's where we start enrolling patients with tumor types that um, if this drug works as we think it should, we should start seeing responses. And, uh, and right now we're saying that internally we should have that data in terms of enrolling the patients now, giving them time to get some scans, and then we should have the data at the end of the year that help inform our next steps. Um, and whether that's you know, moving forward with monotherapy um, or um, We've also announced that we're doing a combination with pembrolizumab. We've dosed our first patients back in July in that. Um, and so, uh, so again, it, it's exciting time for, for five prime with both this BEMA readout and this 155 readout coming up in, in the next uh, few Got months. Got it. Um, you know, I, th I think just maybe, maybe could you clarify, you know, what, I guess, level of data you guys will have in hand at the end of the year that will allow you to make those decisions? Um, you know, I think you got, Five or six months at, at the reckon, you know, at the dose that we, you expect to be to be active, um, would would that be enough for you to make those decisions? Yes, yeah, so I, I think it's 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 definitely going to be preliminary efficacy. Uh, you know, so that's why it's not going to be a full data set. We know it's important with immuno oncology drugs that you also get um, some sense of durability, et cetera. But I think it's it's definitely going to be enough for us internally to determine how much more should be we should be investing. And I think that's that's the distinction that we want to make. Yeah, I, I think um, just to add to that, Robert, um, I, I think we, we should have enough data in hand um, by the end of this year to inform next steps with the program. Mm -hmm. and, and to reiterate what Helen said, the um, one decision that we took was to go ahead and move forward with the combination study with pembrolizumab. And that kicked off just last month. We're already enrolling patients. Obviously, it's, it's a dose escalation safety study. Um, but we think it makes a lot of sense to combine these two agents, and we saw it both preclinically, and we hope to see it in the clinic here, which is why we've we've made the decision to move forward with that program. Yeah, I think there's a, there was actually a, a couple of really nice preclinical papers demonstrating a really nice interaction between PD1 and, and CD28. Do you, do you have a sense, um, you know, how the how this molecule interacts? Is it is it mainly through CTLA4? Is it through CD28? Do you have a sense of which is more important here? Well, we've done some really elegant experiments showing that both we think are important. I mean, I think the one thing is that we do think that CTLA by being antagonist, you know, blocking CTLA, what's important there is going to be your trough level. Um, and then, of course, the agonist, meaning you're stimulating the T cell through CD28, there it's going to be your, your peak level. So, so we do think that's important. I like to think of it as sort of giving the T cell a kick. You know, that's the way the, the agonism, the CD28 part works. And so, um, so, you know, I, I think, again, both mechanisms, I think, are going to be important here. Got it. And just, just I mean, if we think about the potential utility, this program is pretty broad. Um, yeah. Any, I know it's one of, one of your favorites, but is there a, any plans to think about partnerships here? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think, uh, as Helen said, we're, 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 we're focused right now on two really important data readouts. So BEMA at the end of this year, early next year, and for 155, the monotherapy data um, that we expect to have in-house before the end of the year. I, I think once we see that data, um, we'll be making more long-term strategic decisions about um, partnership or, or not. Um, we do think and, and I'll reiterate, Robert, what you just said, that the applicability for this, this potential therapy is, is, could be quite significant. And we want to make sure that we give it a full um, chance to, to show what it might be able to do. Got it. Um, we'll just remind the audience if they have any questions to go ahead and submit them in the chat box before we finish. Um, we, we can turn to the partnership that you've recently announced with Seattle Genetics. Uh, maybe you'd like to say a few words on that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're quite pleased to be working with Seattle Genetics. They, they, have, um, they have a great um, track record of ADCs. And so what we've done is license them a family of novel antibodies for a specific target. Um, and um, we're, we're quite excited to, to see them advance these novel antibodies. Got it. Um, just one quick question in from the audience. Um, how are you thinking about the potential for FPT-155 in, in cold tumors, uh, maybe with the, the right combination? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say uh, obviously our focus right now is, is to make sure that we, we give this uh, potential therapy the best chance to be successful. And, and we do believe that seeing monotherapy data in hot and warm tumors is the best place to, to confirm its efficacy. 
Um, I, I think your the the question from the audience is a is a very insightful one. That back based upon the mechanism of action, there is there is reason to believe that 155 could could work in many different tumors on at many different lines. And so our first step is to to really fully evaluate it in hot and warm tumors. Um, and, and then hopefully we get we get the opportunity to expand it much broadly, much more broadly. Yeah, and, and I'll just add, I mean, we do have preclinical data, again, which we presented at AACR over a year ago that shows that we can make, you know, FPT-155 can make cold tumors hot, you know, draw in those T cells. But to reiterate what Tom said, we want to start with the, the lowest bar. We can show evidence in warm, hot tumors. That's the data that we're going to get the fastest, right? And then we can, then the sky's the limit, right, Tom? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um, maybe just um, one last question on the on the preclinical programs that you guys have at Five Prime. A lot of deep science going on. Any thoughts about moving those forward versus potentially maybe in licensing something? Yeah, we have. Um, we've we've been making some really good progress, um, and and the team at Five Prime has been working hard to advance what what I think are some really novel um, new potential therapies that we're working on. We expect to announce um, some movement on, on our preclinical assets sometime this year. We had um, last year gone through a process of evaluating many different external um, uh, options. And, and we decided to, that at this point, we were, gonna, we were gonna focus on what we had in-house already. We think the science is really sound. The, the team that's working on it has, has made great progress. So where we are today, um, our, our focus is very clearly on uh, the portfolio of preclinical assets that we've got, um, and then the two really important um, clinical readouts that we've got for BEMA 155 later this year or early next year. Got it. Maybe one last question on cash and where you guys stand uh, after you reported last week. Yep. We just updated our guidance. Um, uh, we now expect to end the year between 80 and $84 million. Um, puts us um, uh, into early 20, or puts us into 2022. Um, obviously well beyond these important data milestones that we just talked about. Got it. I'm not seeing any more questions from the audience. Um, Tom, Helen, thank you so much for, for joining yeah. us today and thanks for everybody for thank listening you. in as well. Thanks. Thank All you. right, Robert, thanks. Stay safe. All right.